as all webinars uh, will be uh, recorded and then placed on our Replace YouTube channel. If you are also interested in presenting your work, uh, don't hesitate to contact us as we are really focusing on uh, collecting uh, and promoting the available um, expertise that we have in Belgium. Now, before we start, I would like to give you some more information on some practical rules uh, for this webinar. So first of all, um, all webinars and all participants, sorry, will be automatically muted uh, when they enter the webinar, but you can ask all your questions in the chat. Um, every speaker will have 20 minutes for their presentation and then my colleague Maud will follow up all questions and then after the, pres the presentation there's every time uh, some time foreseen to answer questions. Also, if you would like to have a certificate of attendance, please let us know and put it in the chat uh, because if you uh, attend all four webinars, this will count as half a day continuous education for the Brussels region. So for that, you need to have all four certificates. So if you provide your email address in the chat, we will send it to you as soon as possible, together with the invitation for the next webinar in December. Now, at the end of the um, session, there will also be a short survey if you would like to provide some feedback on the webinar. So also, if you would like to discuss a particular topic or have a suggestion for a speaker, you can also put it in um, the uh, questions of the survey. So now, without further ado, I will uh, introduce our first uh, speaker, who is Dr. Maike Verkauteren. So uh, Maike obtained her master's degree in biology, and then she continued her scientific career as a, a PhD student at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine from Ghent University. So she focused her work on the etiology of skin ulcerations in flatfish in the Belgian part of the North Sea, and she currently works as a postdoc uh, focusing on the environmental and human health effects of microplastic pollution, which is uh, a very hot topic at the moment. So I'm very happy uh, that we have Mikey here today to explain that to us. Um, so within her PhD project, project uh, she developed an innovative alternative method to study pathogen host interactions in skin diseases. So this is a very promising tool, uh, providing a valuable alternative for in vivo experiments using skin of marine fish. So Mikey, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I will start with maybe a, a very brief overview of my um, research so that everyone knows the frame I was working in. Um, so I had the honor or the pleasure to work with the common dab uh, flatfish uh, species. And um, as said before, so there was a, um, an increase in skin ulceration, so large wounds in the on the skin of the fish uh, and no one really knew what uh, the cause of this lesion was um, so there was a, a big question from the fishermen like we have to investigate this um, so that was the basis of starting my PhD so I had a task to look into this um, skin ulceration and what could cause uh, these lesions in the flatfish uh, populations um, so we did a lot of uh, monitoring campaigns and um, based on these monitoring campaigns, we found that uh, bacteria and um, previous uh, skin abrasion had an effect on the development of this, these uh, ulcerations. So of course, and um, we, we wanted to look further into that and we want to prove that these bacteria and these skin abrasions caused the skin ulceration. So we started to design an, um, an experimental setup to test this hypothesis. So generally, when you start this, um, you probably all know that we had the R different group. So we have bacterial infected fish, sham treated control fish. Then we had um, two different mechanical abrasions we want to test. So mechanical abrasion and chemical abrasion. Uh, and then we, of course, need control fish. Um, and then we did a power analysis and we ended up with 32 fish per group, which would lead in total to almost 200 fish we would need to prove this hypothesis, which is, of course, a huge amount of fish we would need to catch in the North Sea, um, house and expose to these bacteria and these treatments. 
So we were not really happy about that. And we started to think about how we could um, improve that. And with this split, uh, split plot design, we were able to reduce that number of fish uh, because we were using uh, different treatments in one fish. So the fish was a control for its own um, treatment. And in that way, we could reduce the number of fish to 64 fish in total. So that is already a big improvement. Um, but we started thinking, can we reduce it even more? Can we move to not an in vivo experimental setup, but more an ex vivo setup? So we started designing and thinking and um, brainstorming, and we ended up with a new concept um, called the two chamber skin explant model. And I'm going to start with um, explaining the concept of the model. So we designed it ourselves and we um, 3D printed all these models. I have also one with me here. Um, so it's uh, composed of two different pieces. So we have a top piece and a lower piece. And if we look at it very schematically, um, the upper piece or the top piece is um, connected with a funnel. And then you have the lower piece. And in each of these pieces, there is a hole in the middle. So very basic and very simple, actually. We put the skin of the fish in between those two pieces. We tighten it very good. We put it in uh, a cup and we add medium. And because we have this funnel on the top, uh, we could create two different uh, chambers. So two different environments. And in the funnel itself, uh, we added medium with salt added. So this represents the outer chamber or the outside environment. And then around it, the, there was normal uh, cell culture medium, uh, which represents the inner environment of, or the inside environment of the fish itself. So we can split the outside from the inside um, very well, which gives a lot of opportunities to really um, provide influences from the outside, see what the influence is on the skin without having doubts, is it going from outside to inside or inside to outside? So um, this is a very simple, basic um, model. So we had uh, set up a protocol. So we collect the explants, so we cut, we euthanize the fish, we cut the explants out, uh, we decontaminate them uh, using androfloxacin and polymyxin B. Um, then we mount the explants in the model, we add the medium, and we keep them uh, in culture for at least 24 hours. After that, we can um, fixate the tissue and look for effects, look for um, what, the, the, what the stressor has done to the, the skin. So the big advantage of using this model is that in one fish with a fairly okay size, so not the smallest fish, of course, but a, a normal fish, definitely common dab, we can um, use four skin explants from the pigmented side and four skin explants from the non-pigmented side and add one control um, tissue sample from each side. So this means that when we go back to our experimental design for an in vivo experiment where we ended up with 64 fish. If we use the skin explant model, we can reduce it even more to only eight fish to test this hypothesis. So that's an enormous reduction, even if you think when we started with uh, almost 200 fish and we go to eight fish uh, that, is, that are needed to test this hypothesis. So we can reduce the number of fish that are needed and we can refine um, the experiment, uh, since we don't need to do any treatment with living fish, but we can utilize the fish and then use them in an uh, ex vivo model. But of course, we need to know that this model works. So we did a lot of testing. So the first stages was, is the skin structure okay? Is the skin changed at all? Um, do the functional parameters of the skin differ after 24 hours in the model compared to the control? So first of all, skin structure. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this um, histological view of the skin of the fish, but very briefly, we go from the outside, which is on the left side, uh, the right side, side of the slide, and um, there you have the epidermal layer, 
We have a basement membrane, dermal layer, and uh, muscular tissue. I don't know if I can, yeah, I can show it. So here is the outside. So we have the epidermis, dermis, which goes here uh, until here, and then the muscular tissue. In between, we have the scales. Um, and since the scales are quite um, hard, it's sometimes difficult to make some histological slides because they move around a little bit. So if you see some artifacts like here that the scales are um, bended, it's not how it was in the fish, but it's just an artifact from histological um, sampling and um, analysis. So we wanted to make sure that all these um, layers are still present and that they look healthy and good. So we did, um, we used our protocol, this the different steps I showed before. Uh, we used 12 replicates of three fish and we had control samples of each fish to be able to look at how the skin looked in the beginning and how it looked at the, after 24 hours. Of course, it's not the same, uh, exactly the same um, piece of skin because we need it in the model and we cannot fixate it and at the same time put it in the model, um, but it's from the same fish. So in general, it looks very fine. We have a full epidermal uh, layer. We have the basement membrane still present. Um, if you compare these, this is a very um, zoomed in picture, so very close up of the epidermal tissue. And it looks similar if you look at the control sample and if you look at the sample at uh, the end, so after 24 hours in the model. We have a mucus cell, a goblet cell present. We have the eosinophilic granular cells present. And we have the typical structure of the epidermal layer, which starts with um, a columnar layer, then a loose, semi-loose layer, and then the flattened um, epidermal cells on the top. So it looks perfectly what we would expect. But we wanted to dig deeper and be really sure. So we've measured a lot of functional parameters. Uh, we started with the thickness of the epidermal tissue, so very um, simple. We just measured the thickness until the basement membrane um, of the epidermal tissue. And there we saw um, a little bit of increase, but if we compare the expands to the control. So just to um, briefly guide you through these um, graphs, so we have two columns, the non-pigmented side and the pigmented side. We always keep these separate because it's flatfish and these two sides differ a little bit. We also saw some differences in um, the sensitivity to skin ulcerations and so on. So we try to keep them separate uh, for flatfish. And then we have the three replicates, so that are three different fish. And we have the explant, um, the explants and the control samples. So we measured the epidermal thickness in all of these um, samples that we did and multiple times over one sample. And we put all this information in these kind of graphs. So if you compare them, the control uh, versus the explants in all these different situations, you see that the explants um, have a slightly higher epidermal thickness and it's approximately 1.15 uh, times thicker after 24 hours in um, the explant. So what you can also see is that there is a lot of variation um, between these different measurements. So it introduces, being in the explant introduces like um, a little bit more variation. If we look at the number of cell layers, so we can count them going from the basement membrane to the top. Uh, we don't really see a lot of difference, so we assume that the change in thickness is rather due to an increase of the volume of the cells. But we couldn't really um, quantify that. So then the eosinophilic granulocyte frequency, so the number of uh, eosinophilic granulocyte uh, cells is a very difficult word, <laughs> um, so EGCs. Um, so the number of cells per, <coughs> per 100 micrometers of tissue. Uh, there we didn't see any differences between the explants and the controls. The same for the goblet cells, so the mucus producing cells. Um, this is different staining so that you see the mucus inside the cells. Uh, but the number of cells remains the same in the explant and in the control um, tissues. Then um, in a normal tissue, we always expect that there is 
um, proliferation and apoptosis at the same time. So it's a bit of a, a balance between the two. Uh, but we wanted to check that neither one of these scenarios is increasing and, and causing an imbalance in this tissue. So we tested for uh, the proliferation rate using the proliferating cell nuclear antigen. Uh, so this is an immunohistochemical stain. Um, and there we didn't see any difference again between the explant and the control sample. So they proliferate at the same rate. And also apoptotic rate was similar. So all these functional parameters um, seem to do very well uh, and are very comparable to the control of each of these fish. Now, what is important is, and what was very obvious when we um, analyzed all these results, is that um, we collected always a, one control sample per fish. And this seemed very relevant uh, when we analyzed the data, because for instance, for these um, EGC cells, uh, you see that there is a lot of variation between fish. So by including this control per fish, you also include uh, the inter individual variability. So that is very important. And that is something um, when using the model is very important to think about uh, so that you always can compare to the control of the same fish and not increase more uh, noise and variability because you don't have the correct control samples. We wanted to stretch the time frame of our model a little bit and wanted to see if we can increase the incubation time to 48 hours, because in 48 hours, you can expect that there is more um, interaction ongoing if you do an, um, an exposure to a pollutant or to bacteria or something. You have a little bit more time to cause an interaction and to see the effects of this interaction. So we wanted to know if it's, um, it would be possible to increase this uh, incubation time. Um, so this is an, a picture of after 24 hours, so it all looks fine. But unfortunately, after 48 hours, we already saw a detachment of the epidermal um, layer from the basement membrane. So here you see the basement membrane and the uh, lower uh, cells are still present and look attached, but there is a gap between those two. Um, we also see sometimes that the, the two layers are still attached but there are apoptotic zones in the epidermal layer, so where the, the cells are really starting to um, die off. So unfortunately, the model is limited in time, so you can only use it for 24 hours. Of course, maybe with some changes in the protocol, with more regular um, changes of the medium, for instance, it could be that we can postpone the, uh, the time a little bit, but that should be tested anyway. Then, of course, a very important question, is this model applicable? Because we can design a perfect model uh, where the structure of the skin is, is good and comparable to the control. But if we cannot compare it or if we cannot apply this model, yeah, then it's not very useful. So for that, we did a recent experiment. So this is very new information, so it's not fully analyzed yet. Um, but we did experiments with the Vibrio Tapete strain. So this is a strain we isolated from the skin ulcerations in common depth. Uh, and it's a very common strain, but not for fish. It's a very uh, common pathogen for clam species. Um, and it was quite striking that we found it in these skin ulcerations in common depth. Um, so we tried to look at, okay, you have the Vibrio tapetis, who is pathogenic for clams, and you have the Vibrio tapetis, who is pathogenic for fish. And we used the model to test if those two different strains react differently on the skin of this fish. Because we would assume that either those two are very similar and they just have a very broad uh, host range that they can infect, or these two strains are very specific to their own host that they are pathogenic for. So that was a very interesting um, hypothesis to test with this model. So we tested it again with the intact skin. And what um, we saw was that the, the clam isolate, so it's called the CSCT 4600, which is not important, but it's the, the strain isolated in clams um, and very pathogenic in clams there. 
uh, we see that they sometimes um, gather in the goblet cells, but they really stay at the surface of the um, of the skin. Here is also a bit better picture. So you see that in the, the flattened layer of the epidermis, um, all the way on the outside of the, of the fish skin, there sometimes you have some invasion of, of the clam isolate. But with the fish isolate, you see more invasion and deeper layers of the epidermal tissue. It's not that deep, of course, because we have a quite um, short in, um, incubation time. So 24 hours only. Uh, we also tested it with a braided skin. So that is also a, an, um, an added value of this uh, skin explant. Because before we collect uh, the skin explants, we can also abrade the skin. So we utilize the fish, we abrade the skin with mechanical abrasion, so scraping off the epidermal layer, uh, and then put this abraded skin in the in the model. Uh, and when we use these this abraded skin, so this is also what we saw when we uh, did the monitoring campaigns, that this abrasion of the skin in collaboration with these pathogens cause these skin ulcerations. So that's the, the, the hypothesis behind this experiment. So with the abraded skin, we see that the clam isolate is like very loosely connected to, um, to the cells. And with the fish isolate, it's more integrating or invading into the tissue. So you also see here, um, this is a fish isolate. So it's, it's going inside the tissue and very deep. Um, and here we also see beyond, uh, below the basement membrane, we see some um, penetration of these fibriotapetes. We are still analyzing it, so it's very um, preliminary um, results. But it is very interesting to see how these two different strains of the same pathogen um, react differently to um, an invasion or, or to exposure to the skin of the, the fish. And this would um, yeah, support our hypothesis. We also published this paper um, a few years ago that the fact that these two bacteria, bacterial strains really are um, different and that would um, support our hypothesis or support what we see in the skin explant model. So with this experiment, we were able to show the interaction of the pathogen with the fish skin and see how um, how the different strains react to it. Um, of course, it's not only limited to um, host pathogen interactions um, or vibrio in, in interaction with common DAP and, and specifically. Um, we believe that we can also test the effect of toxins. Effect of microplastics would also be nice to test. Um, we can test other bacteria and we even um, can test uh, the, the use of, of this model for other diseases and other fish species. For instance, um, you have the Flavobacterium columnare disease, um, which is affecting a lot of fish, important fish in aquaculture. And this um, bacteria can also be tested using this model. It's also causing skin ulceration, so it's very close to what we did with the common DAP, of course. Um, but it would be very important and it also um, broadens the application of this model in, into aquacultural um, research. So just to finalize um, and just sum up the advantages and disadvantages of our model. Um, so we can test outside inside a hypothesis for um, host pathogen interactions, but also other conditions. Uh, the model complies with the 3R principle by reducing and refining. Um, and it would be applicable for other species, but that still need to be tested. Uh, the disadvantages is that we see a little bit um, increase in epidermal thickness, and we see inter individual variation, which means that we need to uh, take into account the proper controls, and it's limited to 24 hour exposure. So if you expect um, effects on very long term, then this model cannot help you. So it seems a promising tool, providing a valuable alternative for in vivo experiments using the skin of marine fish.
So that was it for me today. So uh, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Mikey, for your uh, interesting presentation. Uh, you have already done a lot of work <laughs> on this model, I believe. I actually already have <laughs> a few questions. So if I understood correctly, you, uh, all your research was done on one particular type of fish in the North Sea. So you already indicate it's possible to test with several fish species. species. And is it also then both salt water and uh, sweet water that uh, as fish <laughs> that you can test? Well, it? You, you can stick to this um, separation between salt water and, and the inside environment, let's say, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily needed. You can also use the, the same medium mm -hmm. and just very localized expose the skin on the outside to a certain stressor. Mm -hmm. So the model can provide just uh, the separation of the outside of the skin from the inside is the most important feature. And for us, because we worked with marine fish, mm -hmm. that was a logical thing to do then to, to change the salinity of the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't mean that you have to. Yeah. Okay. And then I had another question because mainly your research is mainly focused on host pathogen interaction. And you, I also saw you have some things on, on toxicity. So I was wondering, is your model being used or could it be used to test the ecotoxicity of particular chemicals? Or are there plans for that? Uh, it is not yet done, but I yeah. think it's it would be very interesting to do um, and very valuable. I mean, yeah. uh, again, it's it's a model and we, we focused on, on the research question on the skin ulcerations. Yeah. So for us, it was a logical step to go to the host pathogen interactions. Yeah. But again, the model just provides a way to separate the outside of the fish from the inside and whatever you want to test on the outside, you can add and you can see what the interaction with the skin is. Yeah, okay. So then in these for the uh, pollution, the microplastics, then that's probably then the next step in your research or that's your plan? Uh, well, that would be very nice, but my research is focusing more and more on uh, human health uh, effects. Oh, yeah, okay. so <laughs> it's a bit oh. out, of, out of the scope. Yeah. Um, but definitely uh, worth to to look forward to it. And, and if anyone wants to use the model and test it for for any exposure, just let us know. And mm -hmm. we have all the models printed. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. I have one uh, final question <laughs> before I, I go to Mut, uh, because you said that um, the maximum time, more or less, is twenty four hours, uh, and that you would be able to extend it. So I was wondering. Can you do then multiple measurements or, or what is, would be the maximum extent that you would see possible? Is it like 48 hours, 72 hours? What, what do you think is the, the outer limit? Well, for, for um, skin explants, it's always limited in time. It's very difficult mm -hmm. to keep the full um, skin or full tissue viable in an uh, outside of the body. Um, we had a lot of problems with, with even keeping it, keeping it for 24 hours in the beginning. Uh, but then we noticed when we change the medium more regularly, uh, the viability of the tissue remains quite good. So we really, in the beginning, we, we change every half an hour, then we go to one hour and then uh, it can be extended a little bit. Um, but for going to the 48 hours, we might have um, included too, too little changes of the medium. So with yeah. increasing that, it could be that the skin explant remains viable. But yeah. I think going beyond 48 hours yeah. will probably not be feasible. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. You had a very clear answer to all the questions. So I'm not sure both if there are other questions in the chat. Um, no, at the moment there is no other question in the chat, but uh... Maybe if you have other questions later, um, you can still contact Mike uh, for more information. Yes, definitely. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you again, Mike, uh, for your nice presentation. So now it's time for the second uh, presentation by Ingrid Vernemmen. So Ingrid is also a veterinarian uh, that uh, studied at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at Ghent University, uh, where she graduated in 2019. So after that, she joined the equine cardio team at the University of Kent, uh, where she is also currently conducting her PhD research on the use of the echocardiography in electrophysiological and interventional procedures in horses. 
uh, and it's a project funded by the FWO in the Flemish region. And then she also uh, participates in several clinical activities on the diagnosis and treatment of horses with cardiac diseases. And then she mainly works on uh, echocardiography, electrophysiology and interventional cardiology. So Ingrid, the floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so yeah, indeed, I will explain uh, you something today about the ultrasound compatible model um, of the equine heart that we have developed, or you can also call it an equine echocardiography simulator. Um, so these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, my research project is uh, funded by FWO Flanders and was approved by our lo local ethical committee, and we have no conflict of interest to disclose. Um, so why do we want to make an ultrasound compatible uh, model of the equine heart? Uh, well, heart rhythm disturbances, also known as arrhythmias, are common in horses and they can cause exercise intolerance um, and they can increase the risk for casualties, putting both horse and rider at risk for injury. Um, so to date, we diagnose these arrhythmias using electrocardiograms like uh, the one you see here. Um, and we use echocardiography to see if there is an underlying structural cause for the arrhythmia, as this has implications for both treatment and prognosis. Uh, for treatments, we already do pacemaker implantation and also cardioversion is already available uh, in equine cardiology. And recently, we have started uh, performing ablation as well for some uh, arrhythmias. However, both for diagnostic and therapeutic possibilities, this is only the tip of the iceberg of what we could possibly do uh, in equine cardiology. Um, so, compared to human medicine, equine cardiology is actually still it's in, in its infancy. Uh, and therefore, we look a lot at what is already possible in humans. Uh, so the greatest innovations happen in the field of minimally invasive intracardiac uh, catheterizations, which comprises a group of procedures uh, performed by putting catheters. So these are long wires with which, uh, with which you can detect or induce uh, electrical activity. And those, these, uh, so these uh, catheters are introduced via peripheral vein or artery into your heart. Uh, in order to perform a specific diagnosis of an arrhythmia or uh, to perform a treatment. Uh, so I previously mentioned uh, the ablations. Uh, so this is a procedure in which the origin of an arrhythmia is traced. So like you can see here, I hope you can see that. Um, and then uh, the origin is damaged by using a radio frequency energy in order to stop the arrhythmia. Um, you can imagine that a procedure like that uh, should be performed very accurately. And therefore, adequate imaging guidance is, of course, needed. Um, so in humans, they use fluoroscopy. So this is an imaging uh, modality which uses X-rays and allows to continuously uh, visualize the catheters in the heart. Uh, however, since horses have such a large thorax, uh, fluoroscopy does not provide enough detail to guide such a procedure in horses. And so this lack of adequate imaging guidance uh, is the main reason why these kind of procedures aren't fully developed in horses yet. Um, so what kind of imaging guidance do we have then in horses? Uh, well, we use echocardiography. So this is an imaging uh, modality based on ultrasound beams, which are sent out by the ultrasound uh, probe and reflected by the tissue, thus creating an image. Uh, so this is the standard imaging modality in equine cardiology. And in contrast to fluoroscopy, uh, where you get a superimposed image of all tissue that is being radiated, Echocardiography works with a two-dimensional plane, which you move through the three-dimensional structure. And so in this case, this is the heart. And so this, this way you can visualize the heart in order to diagnose disease or to, to guide the procedure. So you can see this in this, in this video here, how we make a couple of standard views of the heart. So you can imagine that if a catheter is present in the heart, so one of those wires that, that's needed for the diagnostic procedure, it can be challenging to see that, um, that three-dimensional catheter on a two-dimensional plane. So I have an example here. So this is an echocardiographic image uh, of a horse in which we've put a catheter there. And so the yellow highlighted line shows where a catheter is present, but you see that sometimes due to contraction or due to tilting of the probe, uh, the catheter isn't visible anymore. Um, so everything taken together, I think it's clear that uh, that echocardiography can provide really nice images, but it has a very steep learning curve, especially to guide these catheterizations. 
Uh, and therefore, clinicians need a lot of practice on horses in order to master this skill. Also, if you want to develop new catheterization procedures uh, specifically for horses, uh, this requires an, an extensive development time uh, performed on living horses. So, therefore, we are looking for an alternative, especially to cover the first practical sessions in the education of standards equine echocardiography, but secondly, also to be able to train visualizing these catheters, which is actually a discipline called interventional echocardiography. And uh, thirdly, in order to develop and find you new catheterization procedures, and their guidance before performing them in living horses so we are able to diagnose and treat more of these uh, arrhythmias in horses. So the aim of this study was therefore to develop an ultrasound compatible uh, anatomically correct uh, three-dimensional model of the equine heart. Um, so for this pur purpose we first needed a three-dimensional computer model of the equine heart with adequate anatomical guidance. So Normally, such a model is mainly constructed based on CT or MRI images, but as I have shown you uh, two slides before, the thorax of a horse does not fit in the CT or MRI gantry, and therefore there is no protocol um, to perform a contrast-enhanced CT of an equine heart. So therefore, we developed such a protocol over the course of five ponies, uh, so these ponies were just small enough to fit in the CT gantry, and care was taken that uh, this protocol would provide visualization of all cardiac chambers and all associated uh, vessels directly connected to the heart. This protocol was also ECG gated, which means that the images made by the CT were synchronized with, with cardiac cycle. So that means that we can choose if we want to store the images of uh, cardiac contraction or relaxation. Um, in the end, we needed three scan phases. So that means that we scan uh, the heart three times after each other um, in order to image all heart compartments, compartments and all associated vessels. And so the video that is shown here, that's uh, the second phase where you can mainly see uh, the visualization of uh, the left heart. So left atrium, left ventricle and aorta. Um, so I think it's coming up now. Um, it goes a little bit slow, but then we will see it here now uh, that the, yeah, here we have aorta and, um, and the left uh, atrium and left trench, I don't know, left atrium, left ventricle here. So um, now we have our three dimension, uh, yeah, our CT images, and then we export these in order to perform segmentation. Uh, so segmentation that is actually that we select separately uh, the inside of the heart, but also the heart muscle in order to construct really a three dimensional computer model. So this is done for the three uh, phases that we uh, have. Um, after. Um, We've uh, segmented these three phases, we combine these and also we combine it with a myocardium. So then you get a computer model like this. And then we perform some post-processing uh, to prepare the model for 3D printing. And in addition, the model is also scaled to adult horse size because up till now it was still a pony sized uh, heart. Also, in addition, based on anatomical data that we already have, uh, we also put some markers in the model to locate two important electrophysiological structures, namely the sinoatrial node, which is like the internal pacemaker uh, of the heart, and the atrioventricular node. And so now, um, based on this computer model, uh, the actual uh, three-dimensional ultrasound uh, compatible model can be developed. Uh, so therefore, there is a mold is printed of is 3D printed of the inside of the heart um, to allow ultrasound compatible silicone to be poured into the mold and form the cardiac muscle. Then the 3D uh, phantom was then placed in a water tank with silicone windows uh, to uh, allow to mimic transthoracic echocardiography as you would do it on a horse. Um, and then in addition, we also uh, provided connection parts. Uh, so these were also 3D printed to allow the introduction of catheters into the heart, uh, but also to allow the introduction of an intracardiac echocardiography catheter. I will talk about this intracardiac echocardiography later. Um, so this is what it finally looks like. So this is the transparent tank uh, filled with water. Um, a probe can be positioned uh, against the silicone window. There's also a silicone window on the other side. And then we have these uh, black connection parts through which uh, catheters can be introduced 
uh, in order to uh, simulate uh, diagnostic and therapeutic procedures and especially simulate the guidance of these procedures with uh, ultrasound. So, and what do the images then look like? Um, so, we have here two images. On the right side, uh, we have um, the ultrasound image of the heart model. And then on the left side, we have the same image uh, made on the pony on which the final model was based. Uh, so, this is called the four chamber view. Uh, it's one of the most standard views in equine cardiology. And so, we can recognize the four chambers of the heart. Um, one difference to notice in order to understand these images um, is this, this space here that you have. So, between these two white lines, this is actually the silicone window. And then here, this, um, this blackness here, that's the water in the water tank. And then here, the model starts. So, and this is a, yeah, so a rather, I mean, not so such a big difference, but still uh, with uh, living um, images because um, in a living horse, then you have the skin, intercost, uh, intercostal muscles, and the heart lying directly against each other. So, to uh, interpret these images, you actually have to look like this, and then you see that it's quite similar. Um, so, this is another standard view that we make uh, to compare the both, uh, both living and the model. Again, you can recognize some anatomical features. So, we have the aorta here that is coming back here, uh, the pulmonary artery, this cleft here that uh, goes to the left atrium, um, and then the right heart and this side. Um, another example that we have here now, we have the right heart from right atrium, right ventricle to pulmonary artery. We see that coming back here with the aorta in the middle. And even this papillary muscle here is something that we see coming back uh, in the model. And a last example, so this is a typical uh, also, a typical standard view that we use in uh, equine echocardiography. This is a short axis of the ventricles. And again, we see these papillary muscles here that give like a mushroom like appearance of the ultrasound image. And we see this nicely coming back uh, in our heart model. So, um, we performed also a small study in the context of a master thesis in which uh, six students could access the ultrasound simulator and five students couldn't. Um, as a control group. And so they both had first a theoretical lesson on two standard views that they should be able to perform in equine cardi echocardiography. Um, so then the first group had access to the ultrasound simulator for one week and they could choose how long they could practice on it um, to prepare their cells uh, for an examination in which they had to perform these two images on a living horse. Um, so, both groups had to make this and, and then the hypothesis was that the group with access to the simulator would deliver a higher quality image than the control group. However, um, no difference in quality between the two groups was found, probably because with a, a quite low sample size. Nevertheless, when we looked within the group with access to the heart model, we could clearly see that the more time they had spent practicing on the model, the better the quality of their image. Um, in addition, we are also starting to look now at using the model for training of interventional echocardiography. So, it was the second goal of our uh, model. And a part of this field is the use of intracardiac echocardiography. So, intracardiac echocardiography is um, a modality in which we use a catheter with an ultrasound probe mounted on the tip of the catheter. So, the probe would be here and you can steer it from the outside. And this way, you this allows to do some echocardiographic imaging from the inside of the heart. And this has a couple of advantages because um, if you have a fat horse or a very muscly horse, or sometimes we have the lungs covering the heart, um, that all, all complicates our transthoracic echocardiography. And with intracardiac echocardiography, we don't have um, these um, drawbacks. So um, we're already performing a bit of this intracardiac echocardiography echocardiography on living horses and when we compare it on a model it also looks quite similar so especially this indentation that we have in this specific region in the equine heart we can see it nicely coming back uh, in our heart model um, so what will we do now with our model so first we have to realize there are some limitations so there is no flow in the heart and 
like in a real horse, of course. Uh, and this flow can have an influence on the way the catheter behaves within the heart and, and how it can be manipulated. So in this setup here for a human heart phantom, um, flow can be included. However, we should uh, look at the compatibility with our catheter inlets, which are really necessary to uh, simulate these catheterizations and the guidance of these catheterizations. Uh, secondly, there are also no heart contractions uh, in our model, which again in a real horse can have an influence on catheter motion and manipulation. Um, another uh, limitation uh, is the absence of valves, um, which are quite important landmarks for standard views in equine cardiology. And it is uh, I, therefore it's something to take into account when you're start I, when you're learning it uh, or teaching it to someone who has his first experience with echocardiography, they should know like, okay, normally there should be valves here and I should have a look at that when I'm doing a living horse. Um, another limitation is, of course, it's based on a pony heart. And so there might be minor differences with an adult horse heart. However, we uh, think they, they will be minor since ponies and, and horses are the same species. Um, a last issue to take into account uh, when using this setup is also the occurrence of air bubbles, which can get stuck into the heart and can give uh, some artifacts on your ultrasound imaging. So, of course, there's still a lot to do with this model and we are only getting started. Um, we are planning to implement the model in the first phase of our echocardiography training of clinicians before they practice on real horses in order to replace the use of horses in that first part of the training. In addition, this model can also replace horses in the training of interventional echocardiography, and thus we are improving the safety and the speed also of these procedures uh, when performed on clinical patients. And in addition, and that is a work in progress in um, my uh, PhD project, it is the development of standardized imaging um, of catheterization specifically for horses. Uh, so this way, the number of horses needed to develop and fine tune such a procedure can be reduced. And lastly, uh, the same protocol that we've used now in our study can also be used to develop uh, phantoms with pathological conditions, uh, such as structural, structural defects, for example, in order to allow the training of catheterizations to treat these conditions. So I hope this was interesting. I thank FWO for financing my project. I thank the replays for giving me the opportunity to present my work. And I thank my team for all their help during this project. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, much uh, Ingrid, for your nice presentation. It seems that your 3D model nicely represents the reality and that uh, the, the images that you showed really they nicely overlap, especially with the mushroom. <laughs> it was very clear that <laughs> it was a good model. I actually was wondering, for the future of this model, do you think that it would have the biggest impact or the main impact for the training of clinicians in, 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 in the education? Or do you think there are also more possibilities to have a big impact in diagnosis and treatment? Well, I think on the long term, it will be more training because now we're really like in a roller coaster of developing these new uh, catheterization uh, procedures. And it's really about gaining experience in guiding these catheterizations mm. and uh, getting used to how to look at them, how to guide them. Um, but once this is something that is getting settled in equine cardiology, I think it will mm. more be like a training tool for new clinicians and new specialists that need to yeah. train uh, these uh, skills. Yeah, and then I had another question because you said that you already did a test with uh, some master's students and that you did not really see a difference. So I was wondering, do you have plans to repeat this um, exercise with a bigger amount of students? Um, it's not planned yet, but it might be interesting to have a look like how quick, now that we're going to implement it with the clinicians, how quick that they are learning it and if it seems to be going quicker compared to how we used to learn it. So, but it's something that we might do in the future. And also we have a skills lab at our faculty. So it might be interesting to uh, uh, include it there and see like, yeah. okay, how quick are the students learning it there um, compared to students without access, yeah. Yeah, because you indeed said that there was no difference between the two groups, but the training period was then one week. So maybe if your training period is longer, it might also have an impact on the on the results. Um, yes, indeed. And yeah. uh, another um, thing that 
it isn't quite natural because we didn't want to have like uh, a bias in uh, between the two groups is that normally when you would train something like that on a simulator feedback is also very important and i couldn't give any feedback during the practical sessions on the simulator yeah. so i think yeah if you have that feedback you'll also learn quicker with the simulator but of course mm -hmm. it's difficult to implement in an experimental setup but I think this will have a big impact on the learning uh, effects of the simulator. Yes, indeed. Good, good remark. And then I have uh, one final question because I was very interested because you mentioned that you have some limitations, that you don't have flow, you, you don't have the valves, you don't have the contractions. But it was not clear to me in the future plans, will you, are you thinking then to introduce uh, the flow, the contraction and the valves or some parts of that? Yeah, in the first step, not. But I think the flow might be quite easy to implement if we change our setup with the water tank a little mm -hmm. bit. I think for the contractions, it's um, more difficult because um, I, the main goal of our simulator is ultrasound compatibility, that we nicely mm -hmm. recognize and see um, everything on ultrasound. And I think if you would implement something that makes the heart contract, probably it will have another um, effect on the ultrasound, like it would give artifacts or something, it would look less like in a real horse. So I think that will be harder to implement. And for mm -hmm. the valves, um, yeah, then we would, yeah, we would have to look at what kind of material indeed we would have to use because the valve shouldn't impede catheter movement as well, because then it would be like a, a thing that would just stay there and not moving there. And then maybe it would be an obstacle for the catheters. Yeah. So while it's not really an obstacle in, during living catheterization. So, yeah. yeah, we should have a further look into that to see what uh, material would be optimal for that. Yeah. Okay. And one small final question, uh, because you have uh, used water as a medium, have you thought about other media or what is the reason that you have chosen water? Uh, water for for ease of use uh of yeah. course uh but it has a nice i i mean it, the ultrasound beams go nice through it and um mm -hmm. we have the impression that in uh ultrasound um I mean, ultrasound opacity it looks quite the same as blood okay blood is a little bit more mm -hmm. dense on ultrasound but still the contrast is really nice with uh with the myocardium um so for the moment, we don't really have a need for another um, medium in there. Yeah. But okay. in the future, we might change more to something that looks a bit more like blood. But yeah. yeah. It's a bit more viscosity then. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay, thank you very much, Edith, for your answers. I had a lot of questions. Uh, Moats, are there any other questions in the chat? No, no other questions in the chat. Okay, so then uh, I think we're done. So thank you again very much, Maike and Ingrid, for your presentations. I think they are two very nice examples of work towards replacement in, in, in the veterinary medicine. So thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, also, a big thanks to all the uh, attendees who are here today to listen to your presentations. Uh, again, also uh, one small note, all the webinars are recorded and they are placed on our YouTube channel. And if you would like to have um, a certificate of attendance, please let us know. And then also one uh, kind, warm appeal. If you are an expert working in Belgium, uh, don't hesitate to submit your expertise to our database. And if you are interested in presenting your work during one of our events, also don't hesitate to contact us. So thank you very much. And I will see you next time. Our next webinar is on the 12th of December, where we will have a totally different uh, setup as we will focus on the use and development of bacterial assays. So see you next time. Bye bye. Mm-hmm.